So we're going to actually, over the next three lectures, finish up chapter 11, and we're going to look specifically at types of properties of solutions that are called colligative properties. And we're going to introduce to you the first colligative property today. We'll give you a week off for spring break, and when we come back after spring break, we'll talk about the final three different types of colligative properties. So what is a colligative property? A colligative property is a property of a solution that depends only on the number of dissolved solute particles. It doesn't matter what they are. These are the types of properties we're going to look at here at the end of chapter 11. Properties that depend only on the number of dissolved solute particles, not what the solute particles are. Now, if we think of two different solutions, a sugar solution and a salt solution, if I put 10 NaCLs in water in one solution and 10 sugars in the other solution, sugar molecules, those two solutions have the same number of solute particles, 10 in each. Is a, would you consider taste a colligative property? Would the taste of those two solutions be the same because I have the same number of particles in them? No. No, because sugar tastes different than salt. So taste is not an example of a colligative property. So if you're trying to think of, I wonder what would be a colligative property, I don't know. It might be kind of difficult to try to answer, but we'll introduce those to you today. But when we talk about colligative properties to start, we're going to make one proviso about what we're dissolving into our liquid, what our solute is going to be. And we're going to say the solute has to be something that's non-volatile, which means it does not evaporate. So let's introduce a couple of terms to you, the term volatile and non-volatile. When we say volatile, that means a substance that can evaporate easily. Now, usually in liquid solutions, the solvent like water or alcohol or benzene, usually the solvents are volatile. Water evaporates, benzene evaporates, alcohol evaporates, gasoline evaporates. Those are all volatile substances. So we'll assume the solvent will be volatile, but we're going to then try to dissolve something into that solvent that is not volatile. So we're going to assume that our dissolved solute particles are non-volatile. Those are substances that do not evaporate. So what's something that does not evaporate? Well, sugar doesn't evaporate, salt doesn't evaporate, so those would be non-volatile solutes. You could take water and you can mix it with alcohol, but alcohol is a volatile solute, so I'm not going to talk about things like alcohol mixed in water yet. We'll try to get to that a little bit later in the period today. But at the beginning here, we're going to talk about solvents like water, which can evaporate, they're volatile, but you're mixing something in with them that is non-volatile, like sugar or like salt, okay? Now, the first colligative property, and the one we're going to talk about today, is the property of vapor pressure lowering. What this means is if you dissolve a non-volatile solute into a liquid, you're going to lower the liquid's vapor pressure. So a liquid's equilibrium vapor pressure is lowered by having a non-volatile solute dissolved in it. Now, what's equilibrium vapor pressure? Let's go back and review that because we talked about it a few lectures ago. If you have a liquid like water and you put it in a closed container, the water molecules are rolling around on top of each other. They're banging into each other. And if one of the water molecules on the surface gets banged from a couple of molecules below, bam, bam, really quickly, it can acquire enough energy from those collisions to overcome the attractive forces of all the liquid molecules and escape from the liquid and turn into a vapor. That's called evaporation. Any molecule on the surface, that could happen to statistically at any time. So there's going to be a constant rate of liquid water molecules escaping the liquid and turning into the vapor phase. And I'm going to represent how fast that transition occurs with an upward pointing arrow. Maybe that arrow represents four molecules per second, can escape the attractive forces of the liquid, and therefore evaporate or change into a vapor molecule. So after one second, you're going to have one, two, three, four vapor molecules in that little container flying around above the liquid. Because the container's closed, those vapor molecules will eventually smash back down onto the surface of the liquid. 
and they might bounce off it, or they might smash the surface of the liquid, lose their kinetic energy, and the attractive forces of the liquid recapture it. When that happens, that's called condensation. And the rate of condensation really depends upon how many vapor molecules you have in the container. If you only have four vapor molecules up there, there's not gonna be a very high chance that one of them's gonna crash down into the liquid and get captured. So I've got that arrow drawn really small. The only way the condensation rate can increase is if you have more vapor molecules. It's directly proportional to that. So here after, let's say one second, the rate of evaporation is still way more than the rate of condensation. So we're gonna see a net effect of liquid molecules evaporating into vapor. And so after another second or two, you're gonna wind up getting a lot more liquid molecules having changed into gaseous molecules, those little blue round ones with the whites in the middle. When you build up more vapor molecules, now that's gonna affect the condensation rate because now statistically there's a better chance of a vapor molecule hitting the surface and being recaptured. So as you build up the vapor molecules, you increase the rate of condensation. But as long as the evaporating is happening faster than condensing, you will continue to build up more molecules in the vapor phase. That will in turn increase the rate of condensation. But if evaporation is still occurring faster, you'll build up more vapor molecules. That in turn will increase the rate of condensation. And as long as evaporation is still a faster rate than condensation, you'll build up even more vapor molecules. But at some point, you have built up so much vapor molecules that statistically, the rate of condensation exactly equals the rate of evaporation. So when these two rates are equal, that means every time four molecules evaporate, somewhere else, four molecules are condensing. That means the number of vapor molecules never changes. So that becomes constant. And that happens when you reach something called equilibrium. So we've reached a dynamic equilibrium here where the rates of two opposing processes are now equal. And when that's happening, the number of vapor molecules never changes. Now, gases, vaporous molecules do something that solids and liquids don't. They exert a property called pressure. If you have a basketball, a basketball stays inflated because the air molecules inside the basketball are banging against the insides of the basketball. That's causing a force against that, causing pressure. If you're driving in your car, why do your tires stay inflated? Because you've got air inside the tires. The air molecules are banging against the inside walls of the tire, keeping it expanded. Well, if you look at these 30 vapor molecules in this closed container, they're banging against the inside walls of that container. They're exerting a pressure and that pressure is called equilibrium vapor pressure. So the pressure exerted by a vapor that's in equilibrium with its liquid is called the equilibrium vapor pressure, okay? And so water will have a certain equilibrium vapor pressure at a specific temperature. Now, what we're gonna talk about is what instead of, if we have water in this container, what if we have a solution, maybe like a sugar water solution because sugar is a non-volatile solute. So let's take this container here that has water that's in equilibrium with its vapor. And let's say if we can magically dissolve a bunch of sugar in there, okay? According to our first colligative property, the vapor pressure of that solution should be lowered. Now, why does it get lowered? Let's look at the surface of the water because this is the key. You have a lot of water molecules on the surface, but as soon as you dissolve sugar in there, look at this. Here's one sugar molecule taking up a spot on the surface. Another sugar molecule taking up a spot on the surface. Another sugar molecule taking up a spot on the surface. The sugar molecules are blocking some of the places where waters can escape into a vapor. And surface area is really important. We had this in our last homework assignment. I said, how does surface area affect the rate of evaporation? And we said, if you increase the surface area, you're gonna make a liquid evaporate faster. That's why if you have a glass of water, it doesn't evaporate very quickly. But if you pour the glass of water on the ground and it spreads out and there's lots of surface area, there's lots of molecules on the surface that could all evaporate at any instant. And so the overall effect is it evaporates away much more quickly. So here we're doing the opposite. We're decreasing the surface area by putting those sugar molecules in there. And if you decrease the surface area, you're gonna decrease the number of molecules gonna evaporate. And you see this arrow right here? that evaporation rate is gonna go down because there's gonna be a smaller amount of surface area. So with the solute particles dissolved in the liquid, there are gonna be less solvent molecules on the surface because the sugars are taking some of the spots. 
therefore less solvent molecules can evaporate. So that means with less surface area, the rate of evaporation will decrease, it has to. So let me correct the picture. Look at that uh, evaporation uh, arrow I have there. Now that the sugar is dissolved in there and some of the surface is blocked by the sugar, the rate of evaporation, bink, shrinks down, okay? And so if the rate of evaporation is now lower, we're not at equilibrium anymore because the two opposing processes are not going at equal rates. I haven't changed the condensation rate. There's still 30 molecules above the liquid. They still have the same probability of getting captured. Even if they run into a sugar molecule or a water molecule, they can get captured. So it hasn't been affected. So because the rate of condensation now is greater than the rate of evaporation, you're gonna cause some of the vapor to condense into a liquid and you're gonna decrease the amount of vapor. So now the vapor molecules are condensing faster than the liquids can evaporate. So the amount of vapor will decrease. So because of these unequal arrows here, if you watch the picture now, some of the vapor molecules will condense out and you'll wind up having less vapor in the container. Now, what does that do to the rate of condensation? Well, now you've decreased the chance of a vapor molecule condensing, so the rate of condensation decreases. And now we are back at the position where the rate of evaporation, rate and condensation are equal. We're at an equilibrium again, but it's a different equilibrium because now I have a lesser number of vapor molecules, okay? So when the two rates have equalized again, if you notice in the picture, instead of 30 vapor molecules, now there's only 26. And so if you have less vapor molecules, they'll be colliding with inside walls less often, they'll be exerting a lower pressure. This is what happens every single time you dissolve a non-volatile solute into a liquid. And the significance is all those little orange dots in there, doesn't matter what they are. It could be sugar, it could be sodium ions and chloride ions, they're gonna block the surface identically. And so they cause the vapor pressure to be lowered by the exact same amount. This is a colligative property because the amount of vapor pressure lowering only depends upon how much solute is dissolved. It doesn't matter whether it's sodium and chloride ions or sugar molecules or any other non-volatile solute, okay? Now, something else we talked about when we were discussing equilibrium vapor pressure earlier for just pure water is the equilibrium vapor pressure is affected by temperature. So if you increase the temperature, you're gonna make it easier for liquid water molecules to evaporate. So when you eventually reach an equilibrium, you're gonna have a higher and higher amount of vapor at higher temperatures. So as we go from 10 degrees to 20 degrees to 30 degrees for pure water, the equilibrium vapor pressure you eventually achieve is gonna be higher and higher. So at a low temperature like 10, the equilibrium vapor pressure of pure water is 9.2 torr. Raise it to room temperature water of 20, it's 17.5. Raise it to like a swimming pool, 30 degrees or 80, what would that be, 86 or 84 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that, that'd be 31.8. So the vapor pressure gets higher as temperature goes up. And if we make a graph of this, you'll actually see it's actually not a linear relationship. It actually takes off pretty quickly. So at a temperature of let's say 10 degrees, the vapor pressure is right here, 9.2. 20 degrees, it's 17.5. 30 degrees, it's 31.8. If you go all the way up to 100 degrees, the equilibrium vapor pressure is 760. That's the definition of the normal boiling point, okay? So, what are we doing now? We're talking about what if I take pure water and I dissolve a non-volatile solute in it? Let's say I dissolve some salt into the water. Well, what's gonna be the equilibrium vapor pressure now that salt's dissolved? We would expect these values at 10 degrees, 20 degrees, and 30 degrees to be lower numbers. Now, they won't be incredibly lower. It goes down from 9.2 to 9.1, from 17.5 down to 17.4, from 38.1 down to 38.6. But the important thing is it's lower and it needs to be lower because that's what we would expect theoretically. If you were to graph the equilibrium vapor pressures of this solution, you would find that all the vapor pressures would be lower. So the solution's equilibrium vapor pressure is always lower than the equilibrium vapor pressure of the pure solvent. Now, the person to study this relationship and try to predict, is there a mathematical relationship we can use to predict what the equilibrium vapor pressures of solutions would be? 
was Francois Marie Rayle in 1882. And he devised a mathematical relationship relating the amount of solvent and the amount of solute in a solution that will allow us to calculate what the theoretical equilibrium vapor pressure of a solution will wind up being. And this relationship is now known as Rayle's Law. And Rayle's Law states that the equilibrium vapor pressure of a solution is going to be proportional to the mole fraction of the solvent that's in the solution. Now, mathematically, this is going to be the first equation that you will need to know for test three, and it's Rayle's Law written in algebraic form. P sub solution equals chi sub solvent multiplied by P naught sub solvent. What do these stand for? P of the solution means the equilibrium vapor pressure of the solution. That's what we're going to try to predict with Rayle's Law. If we dissolve salt or sugar into water, what's going to be the new equilibrium vapor pressure of that solution? Rail said the answer to that is it's going to be proportional to the mole fraction of the solvent in the solution. So on the right side of the equation, I have my Greek letter chi, which stands for mole fraction. And when it says chi sub solvent, that means the mole fraction of the solvent in the solution. If you've done any of your homework 3H and you were calculating mole fractions, you notice I was always asking you to calculate the mole fraction of the solute, which is much more common. But there's no rule that says you have to only calculate mole fractions of solutes. You can calculate the mole fraction of a solvent. And in this case, this is what's important. So please make note, this is not the mole fraction of the solute. It's the mole fraction of the solvent when you're using Rayleigh's Law. The P naught of solvent means the equilibrium vapor pressure of the pure solvent, like pure water. And the naught at the top is what's indicating to you that it's pure. Nothing's dissolved in it. So P naught always stands for the equilibrium vapor pressure of a pure material, nothing mixed with it. In this case, it's going to be the P naught of the solvent. That's going to be the equilibrium vapor pressure of the pure solvent. Now, I want you to look and see what this equation is telling you, if you can see things in algebra, okay? Let's say we have pure water. Nothing's dissolved in it. What would be the mole fraction of something that's pure water? What would its numerical value be if it's pure water? What's its mole fraction? One. Just be one. one. So if you just multiply one by the pure vapor pressure of water, that's going to be the vapor pressure of that theoretical solution. It's just going to be the same thing. Now, what if you put 50% sugar in there and had 50% water? The mole fraction of the water would only be 0.5, right? Because 50 of 50, 50 would be 0.5 mole fraction of water, 0.5 mole fraction of sugar. If you only have half the amount of solution in terms of the solvent water, then Rayleigh said, I bet that the surface area will be covered half by sugar and half by water. And if it's only half by water, you're only gonna get half of the natural evaporation. So you're only gonna get half the natural vapor. So you're only gonna get half of the vapor pressure. So he would say, if you know what the perfect vapor pressure of pure water is, multiply it by one half, and that would give you the vapor pressure of the solution. If that makes sense, that's conceptually what Rayle thought was happening. Now, he'll be right as long as we as assume there are three things that must be true about our solutions. So solutions will obey Rayle's law if the solution is dilute, because some funky things start to happen once the solution gets too concentrated. You try to dissolve too much solute in there, there's things like ion pairing that occurs. The textbook actually talks about what things may cause deviation. I'll let you over vacation if you want. Knock yourself out and read about that. The second thing uh, that has to be true is the solvent and solute particles have to be about the same size. Because really, if you say the solution is half water and half sugar and their the surface area has to be half of each, then the molecules better be close to the same size. Otherwise, that wouldn't be true. And then finally, uh, the solvent and solute particles need to have about the same attractive forces. And this is a pretty good assumption just because likes dissolve likes. If uh, you're going to make a nonpolar substance and a nonpolar solute mixed together, well, if they're both nonpolar, then they have similar attractive forces, only LDFs. If you're dissolving a polar solute with a polar solvent, they both have LDFs and dipole-dipole attractions. So normally these will be about the same. 
So we're going to assume all these are true in each of the examples we do today. But let me show you how you use Reynolds law because you're going to want to be able to calculate this for yourself. So here we go. Let's see if we can find the equilibrium vapor pressure of a solution at 20 degrees Celsius that is prepared with 0 0.500 moles of sucrose dissolved in 35.00 moles of water if the equilibrium vapor pressure of water at 20 degrees Celsius is 17.5 torr. <clears throat> okay, so to use Rayle's law and predict the equilibrium vapor pressure of this sucrose water solution, we need to calculate the mole fraction of the solvent. So you first you have to be able to identify what's the solvent and what's the solute. What numbers in here tell you which is the solvent and which is the solute? How do you tell? What's the definition of a solvent and what's the definition of a solute? A solvent is the one that does the dissolving and the solute is the one that gets dissolved. Right, and numerically speaking, that would be true if the solvent is the major component, there's more of it. So which one is there more of? There's 35 moles of water and it's only 0.5 moles of sucrose. So the water being the major component, that would have to be the solvent. Does that make sense? And then the sucrose being the minor component, that would be the solute. Now for Reynolds law, we need to get the mole fraction of the solvent. So that means you take the moles of the solvent, which is 35, and divide it by the total moles, which is 35 plus 0.5. This is how you calculate the mole fraction of the solvent. And then when we do that, you'll get some number. The moles will cancel out. There'll be no units. And to four significant figures, it comes out 0.9859 with a guard digit of 2. That mole fraction of 0.9859 is telling you that this solution is like 98.5% water and 1.5% sugar. And so Rail just thought if my solution is 98.5% water, then the water will only take up spots on 98.5% of the surface. So it's only going to evaporate 98.5% of what it naturally would if there was nothing with it and you're only going to get 98.5% of the vapor. And if you only have 98.5% of the vapor, you'll only have 98.5% of the pressure. So he just took the 98.5% and multiplied it by the vapor pressure if you would have had pure water. And that's Reynolds' law. So we multiply the decimal form, 0.9859, by the vapor pressure of what water would be if it was pure, which is 17.5, and this would be the predicted vapor pressure of this solution. Multiplying a four significant figure number by a three significant figure number, I get a three significant figure answer. So by dissolving this half a mole of sucrose into 35 moles of water, the vapor pressure gets lowered by two tenths of a tor. Okay? Now, this, that's not too hard, right? How could I make this harder for you on your homework? By making us convert from grams to moles. Oh, I'm not going to give you 35 moles and a half a mole. I'm going to say 125 grams of water and 15 grams of sucrose. Oh no, this is impossible now. No, you just have to switch the grams into moles with molar masses. And then it's just like this problem. So Mr. Gomez, that's not going to freak you out over vacation, is that? No. Okay, that... good. You'll be able to handle that. That's really good. Now, the sucrose here is... Uh, has a formula of C12H22O11. That's all nonmetals. That means it must be covalently bonded together. And when nonmetals covalently bond together, they form units called molecules. Okay? So a molecule can either be polar or nonpolar. If it's dissolving in water, what do you think it is? Polar. So these are little polar molecules. Do molecules break apart into ions when they dissolve in water? Yes or no? No. They do not. That's why they're called non-electrolytes. Some people unfortunately think non-electrolyte doesn't dissolve in water and electrolyte does dissolve in water. Incorrect. Electrolytes and non-electrolyte are terms for things that already do dissolve in water. When sucrose dissolves in water, they float around as intact molecules. And so we call that a non-electrolyte because no charged particles have been formed. 
This is how you do Reynolds law for a non-electrolyte like sugar. But if you have an electrolyte like an ionic compound, like a salt or an acid, then you have to do something different. And let's show you how that works, okay? So if the solute happens to be an electrolyte, and there's only two types of electrolytes, there are ionic compounds, which are called salts, and then there are acids, covalently bonded molecules that have hydrogens in the front of their formula. The fact that they either dissociate or ionize has to be taken into consideration. And so we're gonna do an example here where the electrolyte is not, where the solute is gonna be an electrolyte instead of a non-electrolyte as it was in the last problem. And then also I'm gonna use EVP as an abbreviation for equilibrium vapor pressure, if that's okay. So we're gonna find the equilibrium vapor pressure of a solution at 20 degrees Celsius that is prepared with 0 0.250 moles of sodium sulfate dissolved in 10.00 moles of water if the equilibrium vapor pressure of water at 20 degrees is 17.5 torr. We're taking an ionic compound, sodium sulfate, dissolving in water. Sodium sulfate is something that doesn't evaporate. It's like salt. Salt doesn't evaporate out of your salt shaker, right? Sugar doesn't evaporate out of your sugar bowl. So these are non-volatile solutes. And when they're dissolved in liquids, they cause the liquid's vapor pressure to go down. So we're going to expect that by dissolving some sodium sulfate into this water at 20 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of that solution is now going to be lower than 17.5. Okay, first thing you have to do to use Reynolds law is calculate the mole fraction of the solvent. If we did it just like the last problem, you would take 10 moles of water and divide it by 10 plus 0.25, but that's gonna be wrong. Because when you have an electrolyte, you actually have a lot more moles of solute particles than is indicated right here. You have 0 0.250 moles of sodium sulfate that's been dissolved but what does sodium sulfate do when it dissolves? What do all ionic compounds do when they dissolve? They separate into their constituent ions. Look at that formula unit, Na2SO4. When that dissolves in water, how many ions will that separate into? Three. It'll be three, two sodiums and one sulfate. Here's the equation you had to write on a previous homework assignment. If you have a solid that's an ionic substance and you dissolve it in water, Look at the formula. There's two sodiums in the formula, and there's not four sulfates. There's one sulfate. Sulfate is an SO4. That'll dissociate into two sodium ions and one sulfate ion. Two plus one is three. So you get three ions for every one formula unit. So if you have 0 0.250 moles of sodium sulfate, because it dissociates into three ions, you need to multiply this by three to get the actual number of individual solute ions that'll be floating around in the solution, blocking the water on the surface. So this is the key to doing a Reynolds law calculation when the dissolved solute is an electrolyte, either a salt or an acid. You take the moles of the dissolved salt or acid and you multiply it by the number of ions each formula unit breaks apart into. So three times 0 0.250 is 0 0.750. Now you can actually calculate the mole fraction of water. Here's how it works. It's 10 moles of water divided by 10 plus 0.75. That's the key. You don't divide by 10 plus 0.25. So in this solution, there's 10 moles of water and there's 0.75 moles of individual solute particles. So 10 out of 10.75 will give you the mole fraction of water. When you divide this, this comes out whatever it does. This is essentially saying that this solution is 93% water. If it's 93% water, that means the surface will only be 93% water. So you're only gonna get 93% of the natural evaporation. So you're only gonna get 93% of the natural vapor and that vapor will only make 93% of the natural pressure. So to get that, we go 0.93 multiplied by the vapor pressure of what the water would be if it had nothing dissolved in it, which is its P-naught value of 17.5. So 0.93 multiplied by 17.5, 
and you'll calculate what the vapor pressure of the solution is, and this turns out to be 16.3. So we would predict that this solution should have an equilibrium vapor pressure of 16.3 torr. Okay. If that makes sense, we're gonna give you one of these problems to try to do on your own. So we're gonna give you two minutes to work this out and then we'll go through the answer. So let's see if you can do this on your own. If you have a calculator, take it out. I want you to find the equilibrium vapor pressure of a solution at 23 degrees Celsius that is prepared with 0 0.300 moles of KCl dissolved in 15.00 moles of water if the equilibrium vapor pressure of water at 23 degrees Celsius is 21.1 torr. So let's give you two minutes. Good luck. So potassium chloride is an ionic compound. It's composed of a potassium ion and a chloride ion. So when you dissolve it in water, each potassium chloride formula unit will dissociate into a potassium ion and a chloride ion. So the actual number of moles of independent solute particles in the solution will be 0 0.300 moles multiplied by two. So you should have determined that there are 0 0.600 moles of solute in this solution. To calculate the mole fraction of the water, you take the 15 moles of water and you divide it by 15 plus 0 0.600. That's how you get the mole fraction of water. This solution comes out to be 0.9615, which is essentially saying the solution is 96% water. So that means you're only gonna get 96% of the evaporation, 96% of the vapor, and therefore 96% of the vapor pressure. So you just take 96% of whatever the vapor pressure is at the given temperature, which was 23 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure was 21.1. So you multiply your mole fraction of the solvent, 0.9615, by the pure vapor pressure of water at 23 degrees Celsius, which is 21.1, and that comes out 20.3 torr. So that's how you calculate the vapor pressure of a solution if the solute is an electrolyte. Okay, so we've done examples with salts as solutes and sugars as solutes. Those are both non-volatile substances. They don't evaporate at all. But what if you're gonna mix it together two components and they both can evaporate? They're both volatile. That would be something like mixing water and alcohol together. They form a solution, water evaporates and alcohol evaporates. So we'll have to see how do you calculate the vapor pressure of a solution where both components are volatile. So in a solution, if both the solvent and solute are volatile, the vapor pressure that you're gonna get is gonna come from both components in the solution. In our example, the water will evaporate to create some vapor pressure, and the alcohol will evaporate to create some vapor pressure. So the vapor pressure of the solution is gonna be the sum of the vapor pressure component from the solvent and the vapor pressure component from the solute. So the equilibrium vapor pressure of the solution will equal the calculated equilibrium vapor pressure due to the solvent plus a calculated equilibrium vapor pressure due to the solute. Now, if the solute does not evaporate, we don't have this term here. And that's what we've done in our past three problems. There's been no vapor pressure coming from the solute because sugars and salts don't evaporate. But if the solute can evaporate, then you have to calculate the vapor pressure from it as well. So how do we do this? How did you calculate the vapor pressure component from the solvent in our previous three problems? How did we do that? Let me know, how did you calculate that? Anybody? Oh, there it is, it already popped up. The way you calculate the vapor pressure from the solvent is by making the mole fraction of the solvent multiplied by the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. That's what we're doing here, okay? So, and unfortunately we didn't figure out that one, but let's see if we can figure out this one. If you wanna calculate the vapor pressure contribution of the solute, you're gonna do the exact same thing, except you're gonna go mole fraction of the solute 
multiplied by the vapor pressure of the pure solute. So if both components are volatile, you actually just apply Reilt's law to both components. If you had some weird mixture of three different components and they were all volatile, you would just apply Reilt's, Reilt's law to all three of them. This is how we're gonna calculate the vapor pressure of a solution if both components are volatile. So let's try an example of this. Let's find the equilibrium vapor pressure of a solution prepared with 0.300 moles of acetone and 0.100 moles of chloroform if the equilibrium vapor pressure of acetone is 293 torr and the equilibrium vapor pressure of chloroform is 345 torr. So when you're doing an uh, equilibrium vapor pressure problem using Reilt's law, if both the solvent and the solute are both volatile, you have to apply Reilt's law to both of those. That's what we're going to do here. Now, in about 25 minutes from now, uh, you're going to be off on spring break, and then for the next nine days, you'll probably do nothing. And then on Sunday night, before you come back to school, you're going to be looking at the homework problem. You're going to go, how do I know if I only do Reilt's law to just the solvent, or I have to do Reilt's law for both the solvent and the solute. How can you tell just by looking at this problem? Any idea what you can see in this problem that would give you a clue that we would need to do Reilt's law for both components instead of like the previous three problems where we only applied Reilt's law to the solvent? What do you see in here that's gonna give you a clue that you have to do this? Um, it gives two different sets of moles. So one of them is 0.300 moles of acetone and the other one is 0.100 moles of chloroform. If you look back at the three other problems we did, I gave you 35 moles of water and 0.5 moles of sugar. So I gave you moles for both components in each problem. So you're always going to be given either masses of both components that you can switch to moles or be given moles. So that's not the telltale sign here. There's something else. A few people are chiming in. Let's see what they've got. It gives you vapor pressures for two different things. And first, Ms. Eckes, it doesn't say uh, that both components are volatile. It just says they both dissolve. All these problems we do, we're assuming that the components they're mixing together dissolve. So it, when they dissolve, the question is, do they both evaporate or not? So when we dissolved sugar in water, they gave us the equilibrium vapor pressure of water, but they didn't give us the equilibrium vapor pressure of sugar. Why not? What do you think the equilibrium vapor pressure of sugar is? Zero. Zero, yes. And then we did the sodium sulfate and the potassium chloride. They gave us the equilibrium vapor pressure of water, but they didn't give us the equilibrium vapor pressure of those ionic compounds because they're zero. So now if they give you the equilibrium vapor pressure of pure acetone and the equilibrium vapor pressure of chloroform, oh, well, they've got vapor pressures because they both evaporate. Does that make sense? Now you may eventually know, oh, of course, acetone and chloroform are both volatile. I've taken organic chemistry. We've used those. I know that, but you know, assuming you don't have that knowledge, there'll be contextual clues like that that tell you you have to do this for both components. So we've got to calculate two mole fractions here. Now, how do we know which one's the solvent, which one's the solute? Can you look at those two and tell me which you think is the solvent, which you think is the solute? Acetone is the uh, solvent and chloroform is the solute. But uh, my question is how do you, for the other uh, problem, we knew the amount of ions that were uh, dissociated, but here we don't, I, I don't know what the form, um, what the equation is uh, for chloroform and acetone. Name the two types of things that are electrolytes that break apart into ions. Uh, strong electrolytes. Uh, it doesn't have to be strong, it can even be weak. What are the two types of electrolytes that you know? Uh, Open up if anybody else wants to help. What are the two different types of electrolytes? What types of compounds are electrolytes? When they dissolve in water, they produce ions. Ions. Acids. Ionic compounds and acids. Mr. Gomez, is that okay? Yes. So look at these formulas or these names, acetone, chloroform. Mr. Uh, Gomez, how do you name an ionic compound? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure you'll pass that nomenclature quiz before too long. It's like sodium chloride, potassium bromide, lithium oxide. Name the metal ion, name the non-metal ion, okay? Let's look at these names. Chloroform. 
Acetone. Do those sound like a metal and a non-metal? No. Not ionic. Let's see. How do you name acids? Hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid. Let's look at these. Chloroform, acetone. Do those sound like acids? No. So therefore, these just must be some kind of things that dissolve in each other, but they're certainly not ionic or acids, so they're not going to be electrolytes. You like that? Is that good? Yeah, that makes sense. He feels Thank much you. better now. Now, let's go back to the mole fractions. Now, Mr. Gomez told us that acetone's the solvent because it has, there's more of it. That's the major component. So to get the mole fraction of the solvent, it's 0.300 moles of acetone divided by 0.300 plus 0.100. And so that's how you calculate the mole fraction of the acetone. Moles of acetone over the total number of moles. That works out to be 0 0.750. And then you can get the mole fraction of chloroform, which is the solute, by taking moles of chloroform, which is 0 0.100, and dividing it by the total moles, which is 0 0.400, and calculate that. Or if you think you're all that, then you don't even do that, because if there's only two components in here, you know that percents always add up to 100, so mole fractions always add, have to add up to 1. So if one component is 0.75, the other one has to be 1 minus 0.75. It has to be 0.25. So if I'm really fancy, I don't even write the other one out because that's just a waste of my time. But if you're not that advanced in math, you could still go 0.100 divided by 0.400, and you'll figure out the answer, and it comes out 0 0.250. So those are your mole fractions. And now we're just going to plug them into this equation where we use Rayleigh's law for both the solvent and the solute. So it's 0 0.750 is the mole fraction of the solvent multiplied by the solvent acetone's equilibrium vapor pressure of point, or rather 293 torr. Then we'll add to that the mole fraction of the chloroform multiplied by chloroform's equilibrium vapor pressure of 345 torr. And we just have to add these together and get our answer. Let's watch the significant figures. We multiply the first two numbers together, 0.750 by 293. They're both three significant figure numbers, so I'll get a three significant figure answer. I've kept the guard digit. And then for the next two, they're both three significant figures. So when we multiply these together, we're going to get a three significant figure answer, and that comes out 86.2 with a guard digit of five. Now in your calculator, just add that whole mess together, and you get some giant answer of 306.05. But what's the correct answer to report? Rules for adding and subtracting go by columns. This one, the last significant figure is in the tenths place. This one, the last significant figure is in the ones place. You have to round this answer back to the ones place. And so therefore this solution will have an equilibrium vapor pressure of 306. Okay, that's how you handle a problem where both components are uh, both volatile. And for Ms. Majeski, they're always gonna be soluble. You don't make a solution unless things dissolve together. But uh, whether they evaporate or not is what determines whether you apply Rayleigh's law to just one component or whether you apply it to two. Now, for a situation like this where both components are volatile, let me go through a little theory with you. I want you to watch this. I'm going to make a graph, and it's going to be a graph of different mixtures of acetone and chloroform. And I want to see if I can graph what the equilibrium vapor pressures of all the different possible solutions I can make in varying amounts of acetone and chloroform. So I'm gonna be graphing, graphing vapor pressure on the y-axis, but on the x-axis, I'm gonna graph all the possible different combinations of acetone and chloroform. So if you look at the very left, what do I have here? I've got zero mole fraction of acetone and one mole fraction of chloroform. So the line at the very left means your pure chloroform. And as you move further and further to the right, you're increasing the amount of acetone you're decreasing the amount of chloroform. So this might be right here, 0.25 acetone and 0.75 chloroform. Here is 0.5 of each. Here would be 0.75 of acetone, 0.25 of chloroform. And when you get to the very right line, notice what you have, there's no more chloroform. That would be pure acetone. So I'm gonna try to graph everything I know about all these solutions from left to right and see what this graph comes out. It's kind of interesting. Let's go to the very left. Let's assume we only have pure chloroform. There's no acetone mixed in it. What's going to be the vapor pressure of that solution if it only has chloroform and no acetone in it? Anybody tell me what that would be? Um, 
Now look, can you tell me what it would be? 345 Tor. Yes. So if it's pure chloroform, we were given in the last problem the equilibrium vapor pressure of pure chloroform. It's 345. I'm just going to graph it right there. Okay. Now, what happens to the vapor pressure contribution of chloroform as you decrease the mole fraction of chloroform? It goes down. Okay. And we get all the way over to the right. I have no chloroform. So how much vapor pressure are you going to get from the chloroform if there isn't any present? None. None. So let me graph it right here. So watch this. You know that little Rayleigh's law equation you've used four times in a row now today? Rayleigh's law says that you calculate the vapor pressure of any solution of any mole fraction of chloroform. It's always going to come out on this line. Rayleigh's law is a linear relationship. All right? Let me go all the way over to the right. If I have the solution at the very right, which is pure acetone, what's going to be the equilibrium vapor pressure of the solution that has a mole fraction of acetone 1 but chloroform 0? What would it be? I think you can tell me the actual number. 293. Exactly. That's the vapor pressure of pure acetone. If I go all the way over to the left, there's going to be no acetone. So no acetone would exhibit no vapor pressure. So the acetone's vapor pressure in blue, I'll graph down here at zero. Rayleigh's law says that as you increase the amount of acetone, you increase the amount of vapor pressure. And every answer you get from Rayleigh's law equation would lie on this blue line. Okay. Now, what's the vapor pressure of the mixture of the two? for anywhere in the middle. Let's say we're right here. We have half acetone, half, half acetone, that didn't sound good, uh, 0.5 mole fraction of acetone and 0.5 mole fraction of chloroform. What's the total vapor pressure going to be? Well, there's going to be some vapor pressure due to the acetone, which would be right here, and there'll be vapor pressure due to the chloroform, which will be right here, and we're just going to add those together. So let me mark those two dots here. So if you just add these two vapor pressures together, that's going to be the total vapor pressure of the mixed solution. Now watch this graphically. The blue line is representing the, the value for the vapor pressure of acetone. The green line is the vapor pressure for the chloroform. I'm going to move that blue line up to the top here and just put it on top of the green line and see how tall the combination of those go. So let's move it up there and it goes to here. Okay. So if you add the contribution from chloroform to the contribution for acetone, you get this vapor pressure for the solution. Look where that red dot is. That red dot is lying on something rather interesting. Do you know what it's lying on? Can you tell? It's is it right in between both of their uh, vapor pressures? So what it's doing is it's lying on the line that connects the pure vapor pressure of chloroform to the pure vapor pressure of acetone. Can you see that? Watch this. Bink! It's right on there. So anytime you calculate the vapor pressure of a solution, the vapor pressure of a solution of two volatile components will always calculate out to be exactly on that red line. So the vapor pressure of a solution will equal the vapor pressure component of one plus the vapor pressure component of the other, and it'll always wind up being on that line if the solution obeys Rayleigh's law. So if the EVP of the solution equals exactly the sum of the EVPs of the two components, as it has here, then we say the solution obeys Rayleigh's law, and we have a name for that kind of solution. That's called an ideal solution. So an ideal solution is any solution that obeys Rayleigh's law. Now, unfortunately, all solutions do not obey Rayleigh's law perfectly. Sometimes the actual vapor pressure of the solution does not lie in this red line. Sometimes it's way higher than the red line. Sometimes it's way lower. So there's two types of deviation that can occur. And we can actually explain those two types of deviations. So let's see if we can try to do that. Let's say we mix two components together. Theoretically, the vapor pressure of the solution should lie on that red line. But let's say it comes out higher than the red line. Look at this graph here. The red line on this graph would actually be a line that connects this point with this point. The actual vapor pressures you can see are a lot higher values. So what's that telling us, okay? First, we have a name for that. 
That's called positive deviation because the measured vapor pressure is higher, more positive than you would expect, okay? And the reason this happens has to do with the attractive forces between the solvent and solute particles. So there's two possibilities. Let's see if you can figure this out. The solvent and the solute particles would either attract really, really strongly, or they could attract really, really weakly. One of those would wind up giving a higher vapor pressure than you would expect. Which one of those do you think is actually causing this? Really strong attractive forces between the solvent and the solute, or weak attractive forces between the solvent and the solute? And we're guessing, oh, we split it up. Some say strong, some say weak. So if the molecules are creating a higher vapor pressure, they must be escaping into the gaseous phase more. So if you escape into the gaseous phase more, can you do that if the liquid's holding you together tightly or weakly? It would be weakly. If you have weak attractive forces between the particles and the liquid, it'll be easier from the breakaway and turn into a gas. You'll make more gas and you wind up having higher pressure. So this positive deviation from Reynolds law occurs when the solvent and solute particles do not attract each other very strongly, okay? So this occurs when the attractions between the solvent and the solute molecules are weaker than the natural attractions in just the solvent or just the solute. And then if the solution has weak attractions between them, do you think that means the solution is more stable or less stable than the two individual components before they were mixed? The thing, would things rather be have weak attractions or would things rather have strong attractions to be more stable? Strong attractions. Right, so if you're making a solution that winds up having weak attractions, you're creating something that's not as stable. So technically the two individual components before they were mixed are more stable. You put them together, yeah, they don't attract each other very strongly. So you have to force them to turn into that solution, which means you have to add energy. And when you add energy to a, a solution to make it form, that solution is an endothermic formation solution. It has to absorb energy to be created. So the solution formation for a substance like this would be endothermic. So if you had uh, a beaker of the two different liquids and they were both at 20 degrees Celsius, and then you mix them together, if it's an endothermic mixing that occurs, do you think the temperature is gonna go up or is the temperature gonna go down? What does endothermic mean? Energy is absorbed. So it absorbs right. it from the liquid molecules themselves. So if it has to absorb energy from the liquid molecules, the molecules now have a lower amount of energy, their temperature goes down. So whenever you have a solution that creates positive deviation, because you're forming something with weak attractions, which is not stable, you have to use energy to make those two things mix, and it takes the energy away from the liquids, and their temperature goes down. And if you were holding that test tube, it would feel colder, okay? So let's see if we can explain the opposite. If you wind up having a graph of the vapor pressures of a solution of two volatile components, and it looks like this, we call this negative deviation. So how come the liquid is not evaporating as much as you would think? What is that telling you about the attractions between the solvent and the solute particles? They're stronger. So somehow the solvent and the solute particles are attracting so strongly that they can't escape, they don't evaporate, so you don't get as much pressure. Exactly correct. This is called negative deviation, and it occurs when you create strong attractive forces between the solvent and the solute. We would say the attractions between the solvent and the solute are stronger than the attractions in either of the pure components. Here's where this would happen. When we were talking about solubility in water a couple of days ago, we said something like formaldehyde will dissolve in water because formaldehyde can hydrogen bond with water. Formaldehyde is H2CO, has an O in its formula. It can hydrogen bond with water. 
But formaldehyde molecules do not have an H bonded to an O. They cannot hydrogen bond to themselves. So a sample of liquid formaldehyde actually have weak attractions between them. But if you mix formaldehyde with water, now all of a sudden, the formaldehyde molecules can hydrogen bond with water, and that's stronger attractions. And that would be an example of a solution that would have negative deviation like this. So if we took water and formaldehyde, they were both at 20 degrees Celsius, and we mixed them together, and you were holding that in a test tube, would the test tube get hotter or would the test tube get colder? Hotter. It would get hotter because you're forming something that's more stable because the attractions are stronger. And if you form something more stable, which means a lower energy state, energy is released. So this solution formation would be exothermic and the heat is given off to the water and then eventually to the glass and then to your hands. And you'll see after vacation, we're going to be doing some experiments where you're going to be mixing chemicals together and you're going to be holding a test tube and you're going, oh my gosh, this test tube is getting really, really hot. Well, why is that? It's an exothermic reaction. You're creating a product that's more stable. And whenever you create something more stable, energy is released and it's released to the water and then to the glass and then to your hands.